Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, and thank you so very much for joining us here on another Barometer Readings webcast. It's been a volatile market the last few days, so we uh, want to get to that and address any questions that you have at the tail end of the conversation. You can email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca, or of course, hit me up in the Zoom chat, in the Q&A or the chat section. So with that, I turn the conversation to our Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer Capital. David, good afternoon. Hi, Pamela, how are you? And uh, and welcome to everybody who's who's on the call today. Um, we're gonna um, move fairly quickly. We've got a few things to, to go through today. <clears throat> and, and we're not gonna prognosticate as to where exactly things are going. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that we're watching uh, and uh, what that means for our portfolios. It's been a difficult week for uh, for investors, as, as Pamela mentioned, especially for those that have been in sort of the broad-based indices uh, in some very specific sectors. So let's get right to it. Um, let's, as, as normal, <clears throat> sort of start from the top. Uh, you know, we continue to believe that we are in a structural bull market uh, and that uh, structural bull markets do have natural pullbacks. This one started in 2013 when we exceeded the highs from 2000 for the S&P in the U.S. Uh, and has been working its way higher ever since. If you look at the bull market of the, of the 80s and 90s, there were some pretty significant pullbacks along the way. But it was sort of one step back and three steps forward, uh, much different than what you see in a structural bear market. And it's really important. A structural bear market has very long, steady, dripping declines uh, that go on for 18 to 24 months. Uh, and then they do make progress in a cyclical upturn in the economy, but then will tend to fall back sharply as you move through that structural bear market. So uh, as it sits right now, we think that we are in a structural bull market. Certainly the markets have been challenged over the last uh, few weeks and frankly, year to date, uh, but, uh, but let's work our way through it. When we look at fixed income, our view is that we've gone through a watershed moment in rates where we went from uh, extreme highs in the early 1980s to extreme lows, frankly, a thousand year lows in interest rates in 2000 at the bottom of the pandemic low. Um, and as we like to talk about what works in rising rates is really quite different than what works in falling rates. One of the most important things to keep in mind is that, you know, rates as they worked their way higher in the 1950s and 60s posed uh, some challenges from time to time to markets for short periods and short corrections. But frankly, from 1951 to 1966, you had a structural bull market in stocks uh, that worked their way higher steadily, despite the fact that there were some pullbacks. So the, the misconception that, that markets cannot go higher while rates are going higher really is, is one that's mistaken. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. Here's the uh, movement in the 10-year yield going back to the uh, early spring in 2020. We see the 10-year yield going from 40 basis points to recently, <clears throat> uh, earlier uh, this week, just under 3.2%. So what we can see is after consolidating from March until uh, December, yields have moved sharply higher in the last three months. And, and it's one thing for rates to move higher slowly. What investors don't like is when rates move higher quickly. Uh, there's always a balance uh, in many portfolios between fixed income and equities. Lots of people own fixed income because they feel that it will absorb shocks when stocks are weak. Uh, and this year is very different than a lot of years in that we've seen rising rates um, and falling bond prices at the same time as weaker stocks. So when we look at, for instance, the long end of the U.S. bond market, the TLT ETF, which is 20 plus year treasury bonds, from the highs, it's now down 38%. So as I've said often, a 38% decline for a bond investor is, is a pretty tough one to swallow. Uh, it's caused lots of uncertainty. And certainly for people who are running what they call risk parity portfolios, which means they try to hold uh, fixed income on one side and equities on the other. They hope that uh, when equities go down, the fixed income will rally uh, and offset the decline in stocks. 
this year, those investors are not only seeing losses in their bond portfolios, sharp losses, but losses in their, their equity portfolios as well. When that happens, it often means that those investors have to reduce the size of their investments, both in fixed income and in equities. And, and what we've seen over the last few weeks is a lack of liquidity. Both the Fed is reigning in liquidity, uh, hedge funds have been reigning in the use of liquidity, and that's caused a bit of an issue for, st for stocks and other assets around the world. When we look at uh, the aggregate bond index, it's now down 15% from the highs. Obviously, a very sharp move lower over the last two months. Uh, again, posing an issue for, for investors. This is corporate bonds, corporate bond index down 21%, uh, and the international treasury bond index down 25%. So I'm pleased to say we have had virtually no bonds in the portfolios over this period of time. In fact, in our macro portfolio, we were short uh, for the vast majority of this period, a significant uh, short position in bonds, but this has posed an issue for investors really around the world. When we put it in context and we go back over history, this is year to date returns uh, for the bond market, for the aggregate bond market, this is a universe of 28,000 different bonds through different, different issuers, and different maturities. The average duration is seven years. The average coupon is 2.2%. Uh, average maturity is nine years out. You can see this portfolio down 12% year to date. It's the worst start to the year for the bond market uh, really in history. So that has a significant impact uh, for lots of investors' confidence levels, and that's washing through into other assets. When we look at the number of central banks that are tightening rates, frankly, we've got more banks tightening today than we did have in early 2008. And not to say that that turns into the kind of washout that we saw in asset prices, but it's certainly a concern for some investors. Now I'd make the case that we're in a very different environment than we were in 2008. In 2008, we were in the middle of a disinflationary period. Uh, as we sit today, it looks very clearly like we're in a reflationary period. Uh, but nonetheless, for some investors, this is a cause for concern. Uh, and certainly the rate of tightening has been a cause for concern for other investors. When we look at credit spreads, because rates have moved up so sharply, there is some concern in the market about the credit worthiness of bond investors for both investment grade bonds and uh, uh, high yield bonds. I wanna point out that the widening in rates in investment grade bonds is nowhere near what we saw in 2020 and certainly not anything like what we saw in 2008. So at this point, really not much cause for concern. Frankly, spreads are more or less where they have been over the last several years, but certainly something to watch. Moving on to commodity prices. Uh, commodity prices, this is the RJI ETF. It's one I talk about often. Uh, month by month, commodity prices have been working their way higher since the early part of 2020. And certainly we've seen them pull back a little bit over the course of this month. We're still trading above the lows from last month uh, and above sort of long-term trend. So as I say, rates moving higher and concerns around inflation are impacting lots of assets. Commodities have pulled back over the last sort of 10 days, uh, but not in a significant way and certainly not breaking long-term trend. Clearly, when the Fed looks at what they're doing, they're concerned, one, about the strength of the job market uh, and what that might do to wages. They're also concerned about inflation, some of it being caused by bottlenecks in the supply chain, but also certainly uh, commodity prices moving higher. They'd like not to see that. We make the case that, frankly, there's a structural shortage for many of these commodities, and it's being exacerbated by what's happening in the Ukraine. But this is the RJI on a short-term basis. To be clear, the relative price performance of commodities versus stocks has been moving sharply higher. In other words, commodities continue to sharply outperform equities. And as we've said often over the last few, few months, the relative performance versus stocks improving is very early stages. Once this generally starts, it goes on for a long time. In other words, many, many years. 
but it doesn't mean that they're immune from pulling back in the short run. So here's the S&P. We talked about this chart last week. This was the one where we said the market was clearly testing the lows from earlier part, the earlier part of the year. This is the February low. And we were here a week ago. And in our comments, we said that we had become somewhat more defensive. If the markets broke those previous lows, it opened a window lower for prices in equities. And we got that over the last few days. <clears throat> S&P broke the lows on Friday, uh, continued through on Monday, a little, little, bit, little bit of a bounce today, but we now have broken these technical levels, which means that for many investors who hoped that that would be the extent of a pullback, they may be reassessing. And there's lots of different components to equity investors. There are hedge funds, uh, there are pension funds, there are retail investors. And then there's the big pools of capital that are almost always there, that are the slowest to move, but they represent a lot of dollars. And clearly the big long only investors are moving their feet and are assessing their equity exposures. So we've taken out these lows that does open up a measurement lower, the S&P down on the lows about 18% off the beginning of the year. Here's the NASDAQ 100. <clears throat> it led the way it broke lows earlier. And we talked about this last week and continued through now down 27% year to date. And the uh, Russell 2000 off about 30% from the highs, which was about midway through December. So small caps performing worse than large caps. In general, growth stocks behaving much more uh, poorly than value stocks, uh, and the S&P 500 with a large component of those large six technology stocks, which have had a difficult time getting impacted over the last few weeks. Now, we can look at all of the reasons fundamentally why, the, why investors are concerned. We can look at all of the fundamental reasons for why it is we think that the market should go higher long term, but the net of it is we have a process that we have to follow. So our baseline case is that 80% of return comes from getting to the asset class that has a tailwind and within that asset class, identifying the sectors or themes that are benefiting from whatever the structural change is that's taking place. And then 20% of return is finding securities to express that view with. My focus is top down macro, trying to understand what the big themes are. And our investment team works at trying to identify securities that meet our tests, that are behaving constructively from a price perspective, where we can find that there are fundamental changes that are taking place that mean the securities are good getting better. We take those securities that meet our tests and where they line up in groups of the market that, that, that we see a tailwind in, well, that's where our portfolio should lie. And then of course, the third piece of the process is that when the macro starts to change for the worse, or when individual securities stop meeting our tests, we have to have discipline around the exit. Because we can have an opinion about what should happen, but what matters is what is happening. And if securities no longer meet our tests, we have to have discipline around making an exit. So we use stop losses. Now we've talked at length about the fact that what we care about from a top-down perspective is we wanna find parts of the market that are showing expanding breadth. So that when we go through a decline, eventually you'll start to see a few securities quietly turn higher against a weak market. That's expanding breadth. And if enough securities turn higher and start working their way into uptrends, that's a healthy environment and then it's often followed by the broad indices working their way higher. So a constructive environment is where more and more securities are participating in a rally. Now, late in advance, often you'll get the leaders carrying on, but the weaklings one by one breaking down. And this tells us that breadth is narrowing. The advance is becoming weaker. And that if it continues, eventually, selling can impact the strongest groups. And that's what we are seeing right now. 
So if we worked our way through it, last week we talked about the fact that breadth in the NYSE was narrowing, meaning fewer and fewer stocks were maintaining long-term uptrends. We also saw this for the global universe of equities. The Canadian breadth models had remained positive to that point. So our long-term models were showing some weakness. In our short-term models, when we track the percentage of stocks trading above their 50-day moving averages, we saw a weakness in Canada, the US, and globally. We also were seeing weakness in the percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum, percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows, and percent of stocks trading above their 150-day moving average. And because of that, we said, look, using stop losses here is very important. Having some cash is very important. And if they continue to weaken, and if securities continue to hit our stops, our cash position will build. Well, here's where we sit today. Short-term indicators are now getting toward quite oversold levels, but they've continued to weaken. It's not for us to guess when they'll start to get better. The Canadian breadth model also turned down, joining the US and the world bullish percents. Frankly, if we look around the world at all of the major markets, those on this distribution chart that are in pink are showing deterioration in breadth. So Europe, Latin America, the Middle East, Asia Pacific, all US and a number of individual countries. So we're seeing a reduction in risk appetite and you can argue about what may be causing it. Clearly the rate of change in rising rates is having an impact. Clearly the supply chain issues that we're seeing around the world are having an impact. Clearly, the conflict in the Ukraine is having an impact, but the combination of factors is causing investors to pull in their horns. Our view is, and it's only a view, that in a reflationary environment, there are certain parts of the market that should outperform and have been, which is where we've been focused, and certain areas underperform, and they have been. But clearly this supply chain issue is one that people are concerned about. This is a chart of all of the ships that are waiting to get into Chinese ports, piled up, waiting to pick up goods to take to the rest of the world and to deliver goods to China to continue to be productive. And the lockdowns are certainly having an impact and that's prolonging the supply chain problems, which are prolonging some of the inflationary pushes we're seeing in various parts of the economy. So let's go back and retest our thesis on leadership and what's happening in some of the groups we've been focused in. Let's start with energy because energy has been our biggest weight. This is a chart of the XEG, the S&P TSX cap energy index. It's been moving higher since the late part of 2020 in a fairly orderly price pattern. The long-term moving averages are moving higher nicely the 200 day, the 150 day, and the 50 day moving average. And the TSX energy index continues to make higher lows, trading above all of those moving averages. So certainly it pulled back over the last week, but still very clearly constructive. When we look at the materials ETF, which is made up of all different types of basic materials, you can see that the long term moving averages continue to move higher. We're trading above the 200 day and 150 day moving average. We have pulled back over the last uh, two weeks, but relative price strength versus the S&P 500 has been moving nicely higher. Again, late in a correction, you can impact lots of sectors that may have great fundamentals, but they're still gonna get impacted by the lack of buyers. But this still continues to look attractive. We've had a move down, a bounce and a second move down, we're approaching the 150 day moving average. So energy materials still continue to look long-term attractive. And if we were to look at the very long-term charts, and this is a chart of the XME, which is the uh, metals and mining ETF, a key part of the material sector, you can see the long bear market that we exited in 2021 
consolidated, rallied, and now we've pulled back toward the long-term moving averages. But this continues to look like a very constructive area to be. Doesn't mean that we won't reduce our exposure, and we did over the last number of weeks. Last week, we talked about how we'd taken our materials exposure down by a little over a half. We took them down again this week because the percentage pullback is significant and we aren't going to try and pick a bottom. Groups that have also held up reasonably well. This is the uh, food and beverage group, consumer staples, nicely rising relative strength. And actually, we're very close to a relative strength new high versus the market, pulling back above rising long-term moving averages. Here's the utility sector pulling back toward long-term rising moving averages, 250 and 200 day moving averages. Relative price strength is staying quite strong. Actually, this ETF is trading stronger than 90% of the securities in the S&P 500. Continuing on, another key theme has been dividend stocks. Uh, strong, productive, predictable dividend growth stocks. This is the FDL ETF. It's a basket of dividend payers. The yield is 3.6%. Dividend growth rate over the last three years has been about 9% a year. Continues to have strong relative price performance. In fact, two days ago made a relative strength new high versus the market. Down a little bit today. So energy, materials, utilities, staples, Dividend payers continue to act well. Let's look at some other groups. Well, the high dividend payers globally, in general, not performing very well, down 32% off the highs. If we go back to the NASDAQ, which we pointed out last week, had broken some significant support, you know, continues to weaken, down 26% in 121 days. If we look at the uh, software sector within technology, big part of it, QQQ or the NASDAQ 100, of course, is technology. The, semi, the software sector is down 40%. Um, the ARC Innovation ETF, which we continue to track, is now down 75%, continued weaker again over the past week. These are some of the most innovative companies on the planet, but good companies don't necessarily mean good stocks. When we move away from technology to consumer discretionary, Obvious concerns here about rising rates, consumer discretionary sector down 30 and a quarter percent. The communication services sector down 33 percent. The um, US financial services sector down 25 percent. And the uh, moving outside the US emerging markets continue to weaken as well. So this is the uh, the uh, EEM MSCI emerging market index down 32 percent and moving beyond uh, just broad emerging markets, China pulling up the rear at down 50%. So there is lots of parts of the market that are being hurt by concerns around inflation, by concerns around a strong US dollar, by concerns around the supply chain. And when you run a portfolio, it's all about picking your spots. So it may be that these leadership groups are able to sail through but we recognize if breadth is deteriorating, it can come back and get the strongest groups. So not only have we used stop losses, but we've on a discretionary basis reduced our exposures and we wanna wait and see improvement in breadth. Things that we would need to see before we put more money to work. We need to see improvement in the breadth models. We need to see not just one good day in the market, but one good day then followed again four to five days later by a second very strong day up one and a half to 2% on heavy volume. We haven't seen that yet. Now we don't have to be everywhere. We need to be in areas of leadership. Leadership clearly has narrowed. We're watching every day for signs that leadership is changing, new leadership to emerge or old leadership to fail. And we have to be prepared to play defense. So this is one of those times when we have to be a little bit more defensive. When we look at where we sit today, we're about 15% cash. Our energy weight is still substantial. That's made up of energy infrastructure and energy companies. Our bond position, which is very short-term bonds, more like cash, also has grown. 
consumer staples continues to be an outsized position relative to the market, a little more larger than where we were a month ago. But as I said, materials has been taken down to a 7% weight, frankly, because it's a more volatile sector. And if the economy were to head to recession, this is one that would be most vulnerable. Industrials continues to be a weight in the defense stocks. And the defense stocks have steadily growing order books. Utilities, a strong dividend payer and very predictable, roughly twice the weight in the market. But technology, almost negligible. Financials, almost negligible. Communication services, almost negligible. Real estate, very small. Consumer discretionary, almost non-existent. And healthcare, almost non-existent. So this is a strange time for us. It's a very polarized market. It's one where there are risks that we are recognizing and we wanna make sure that a little mistake doesn't turn into a big mistake. We're having a very good start to the year on a relative basis versus the market, but it's extremely challenging to navigate some of the cross currents that we're seeing. We are gonna to continue to err on the side of being cautious. If this is a bull market correction, then there will be lots of time to reposition. But as it stands right now, our number one job is not to let the capital erode. In our macro portfolio, again, we took our exposures down sharply toward the end of last week. We continue to be focused basically in reflationary assets, but as you can see, position sizes have been taken down quite substantially. When markets broke those lows last week, first in the NASDAQ and then later in the S&P, it signaled another round of selling that we just didn't want to participate in. Look, there are some silver linings. The market made a new low, but yet on the, when you look at the volatility chart, volatility has been making lower highs since early in the year and even on making a substantial lower low, volatility did not make a higher high. That is a divergence and that's something that is, a, is somewhat a positive. When we look at the bond market's assessment of the risk of recession, the spread between a 10-year yield and a two-year yield or the yield curve has actually widened a fair bit since April. So for those that think when a two-year yield is in excess of a 10-year yield, that you're gonna have a recession, this has gone back to a normal yield curve. We talked last week about sentiment. Sentiment obviously is weak. For so many people where technology has a significant weight in their portfolios, they're feeling particularly vulnerable. We know that exposures in portfolios and hedge funds and mutual funds have come down dramatically. And in fact, there's very few investors who are out over their skis which is what tends to lead to a sharper decline. And we know that the job market continues to be very, very strong. The Fed's view is that despite the fact that they're raising rates, the employment market is strong enough to absorb it. For that, we're gonna have to see. So for now, what we're waiting for is to see one, some improvement in the breadth models before we would put new money to work. Two, improvement in the price behavior in the market. We need to see a rally and then a follow through day. And then three, we're going to continue to watch the economic data and the earnings reports. Revenue growth and earnings growth both have come in above expectation on the quarter with roughly 490 companies out of 500 that have reported. So the market's trying to assess the risks and there's lots of cross currents. So we are no different. We just have to follow our process. If things continue to weaken, our cash positions will continue to rise. But as we sit today, when we look at bull market corrections, the one in 2016, the one in 2018, the one in 2020, and the one that we're in today, this is really no different than the bull market corrections you saw all the way through the 80s and 90s. So until that changes, we continue to believe we're in a structural bull market, but it doesn't mean that in the short term, the tactical pullbacks aren't significant and don't have to be managed. 
we will continue to get more defensive if this was to continue to weaken. We don't want more risk than our investors can accept. So with that, Pamela, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Thanks so much, David. We have one question here. And the question reads, David, would you consider a top in the 10-year treasury yield and the US dollar bullish for equities? Do you believe we are starting to see signs of a bottom forming in the severe market pullback? Yeah. Well, I think it's probably too early to make a guess at, do we see signs? Our, our indicators are clearly sold out or oversold. So that is a positive. Volatility hasn't made a new high. That's a positive. Um, it is possible, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that the bond market was getting to a point where it was extended in the, in the, in the rally in yields and that you could see them pull back. Um, you could also certainly see the US dollar, which is testing high levels, pull back as well. Would the market cheer or be happy to see US dollar start to back off? Yes, absolutely. Would that be good for the types of investments that we're in? Yes, absolutely. Commodities uh, and energy tends to be negatively correlated to the US dollar. So for sure, if we saw yields flatten out and just calm down, and if we saw the US dollar just calm down, then we think that probably you would see a pretty sharp rally in some of the groups that we've talked about. But we can't guess at when that might be. So we just have to be patient. It may be that markets will chop around over the next few weeks or even months until fall. Seasonally, this is a tough time of year. From May to October, we often have bumpy markets, and it's possible that we'll have the same thing this year. In 1994, the last time we had a significant rising rate cycle where the Fed got very tough on inflation, you had a year where the market cycled back and forth in a series of advances and declines, but the market made no progress and it drove people crazy. The most important thing to do in that kind of market is nothing, is to sit on your hands, to hold some cash and wait to see the leadership reemerge and that's exactly what we'll do. Dave, we have a couple more questions coming through here. Uh, could you please comment on the VIX and the trading volumes that you're seeing? And of course, they're asking if we're at capitulation, but um, as you just mentioned, we're not forecasting, but uh, would love your comments on what you're seeing yeah. with the VIX. So look, there's a few things we look at. I mean, this is what we were talking about. Here, here's the, the spike in the VIX in January. We may have had a lower high in VIX in February and March. We've had a lower high in VIX in May. And frankly, when we broke the lows on Monday, we did not even reach the highs we were at in May. So those things are positive. Those are positive divergence. When we look at the look at the spider. Uh, and let's see if we can pull up, if we get volume here. Uh, you can see that we have seen a rise in volume, but we haven't seen sort of a capitulatory spike in volume. We have had two 90% down days, meaning 90% of the volume was a downtick in the market. They tend to mark capitulation. We've seen some spikes in the put call volumes. In other words, the number of people buying puts versus the number of people buying calls, meaning people making uh, uh, trades in puts to protect their portfolio. They've been extended, but it's not sort of capitulatory yet. I think it's possible we've got more to go through in this, in this uh, uh, next leg down. When we broke these lows in the S&P, it opens another window lower, maybe to 38 or 3,900. I'm not gonna guess where. Uh, and things can turn at any time. Uh, but I think right now, the, the balance of evidence is that breadth continues to weaken. Market prices continue to be sloppy. Uh, there's no use in trying to be a hero here. Pullbacks are normal. Corrections are normal. They happen. Uh, you even have, you know, 20% bear markets in secular bull markets. Uh, and they're healthy. They help things to reset. 
So what we want to see is we want to see our leadership groups continue to hold on much better than the market, and they are. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a wait and see, right? We have to do this step by step, and there's no use in guessing. We're not going to ever try and pick bottoms because that can cost money. Um, let's, let's take this step by step. And we keep getting questions coming in about, you know, the, the situation in China, lockdowns potentially increasing. Common theme in these questions, David, that I'm seeing in front of me is basically if you think we're going to be being put into or pushed into a recession. And again, as I mentioned, we're not forecasting, but this seems to be the common question that people here are asking today. So I'll let you speak to that. Yeah. So look, I mean, there's there's things that we can look at, you know. Um, so if you if if you were concerned that there was a, a recession in the very near term, I'm trying to see if I can find the two year. Here we go. Two year yields. So this is where the market expects interest rates to be in two years, two point six percent. And when we go back only to the beginning of the year, the market thought yields were going to be at 0.73 of 1%. If the market really believes we're going to go into recession and the Fed is going to pause on their interest rates, these two-year yields are going to come down sharply. We're not seeing that. So when you look at the difference between the three-month treasury bill and a two-year bond, it's still pricing in a ton of interest rate increases. I think the thing that people grapple with is the Fed's plan is to raise rates, um, but will, and, and they're doing that to fight inflation, but will it choke off the economy? At this point, the bond market is not telling us that we're going to choke off the economy. Earnings and earnings estimates are not telling us that, but there's probably an increased risk that they misjudge. So that's what we have to watch. Um, so, uh, realistically, there's, there are things to be concerned about, um, and there's a big range in possibilities of the things that can happen. Uh, so we just have to step-by-step step manage each individual position within the portfolios. When I look at the supply chain issues, you know, that's why, for instance, probably the semiconductor index is down the way that it is. If I look at the XSD, which is the unweighted semiconductor index is down 35%. The markets have discounted a lot of this concern. And at some point it will be overdone. But seasonally it's a tough period and the breadth models don't give us any license to put on new positions. So we got to wait uh, and just manage the positions in the portfolio. Thank you so much, David. The next question is about cryptocurrencies, which have really pulled back lately. Does Barometer still continue to have exposure in the cryptocurrency space? Perhaps you could speak to it. And sure. relative to gold, what, what do you think is a better alternative asset class? So as, as we've talked about, I mean, we have been taking, we, we have been taking that position down for some time. Uh, it was a much smaller position over the last few weeks uh, and sm got smaller again last week. If you looked at uh, Ether, for instance, see if I can find it here. So here's the low in Ether in January. Here's where we sit right now. We're above those lows. It's acting better than the S&P, uh, but certainly uh, it's, it's testing. It's testing. And I don't know whether we hold or not. What I know is that when we took out these lows here last week, we reduced our, our weight again. Um, and we'll see. You know, we can always buy a position back. The long-term picture, you know, is not an unconstructive. I mean, if you look at a very long-term picture, it's very not, not an unconstructive price pattern. Let's see if I can make that just a little bit better. Can't. Here we go. You've got these lows that we touched on early in the year, but you know it's tenuous, and they're still a long way above long-term moving averages. So we just chose to take our take our weight down. 
on uh, on gold, you know, the long term picture continues to look quite constructive. If you look at that price pattern, you've got a cup and a handle we broke out of, and we're just simply retesting that breakout. Um, but again, you know, we took our exposure down a little bit because we want to have flexibility. When you get a sloppy market like this, you want as much flexibility as you can have. Now, what are we doing while we're not invested? We run screen after screen to see what is holding up on a relative basis versus everything else. We're looking for things with rising relative strength and we're looking for areas of breadth. The breadth models aren't showing us anything yet, but we are seeing some areas that have better relative strength. And frankly, they're the areas that we're focused on. So that's a positive. We're seeing no areas that we're not focused in that are showing improving relative strength. So at this point, the leadership probably is what it is. But we got to keep asking that question, keep doing the work, and there will be an opportunity to buy a turn. It's just not yet. Well, that's great, David. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on and communicate uh, what Barometer is doing during this volatile time. And that always, I will leave you with the final word. I look forward to seeing everyone here, same time, same place. Look, the, the, the picture hasn't changed much. We have an inflationary environment. Um, the, the system is, is still sort of a wash with cash. Um, we are more likely to see inflationary assets continue to outperform. Uh, and so the, these are where our positions lie. Um, if something starts to change, then, then we'll look at, look at other areas. We'd love to broaden out the exposures that we have in portfolios, uh, but you can't manufacture it. You've got to wait and see it emerge. So I think the most important thing to do here is to have patience. If things lose their grip and start to weaken that we own, our job is to, 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 to remove or, or, or reduce the position. Um, but um, look, there's a lot of cross currents going on in the world. And the reality is that uh, there's lots of uncertainty and markets just don't like uncertainty. At some point, some of these things will start to clear and the market will start to lift. Uh, but until then, let's sit on our hands and, and, and wait and see what happens. It may be a bit of a boring summer. Thanks so much, David. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, hopefully it's useful. If you're, if you want to follow in between, I do post things to Twitter uh, at barometer CA. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, last, last Thursday or Friday, as markets were threatening to break the lows, our view was, we said, we said, look, if, if we close here or below, it's probably going to be a sloppy week next week in the market. Um, that was sort of a heads up to, to make sure you were following your stops. Uh, and being prepared to take off positions that weren't working. I think you always have to be able to do that. Uh, and we'll keep on posting what we see going on. And if you'd like to join us, we're happy to have you here every week. And if you'd like to talk further, don't hesitate to give us a call. We'd love to have a conversation. So uh, until next Tuesday, everybody stay safe. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, David. Thank you.